my job is to hopefully briefly talk to you about how I, as a medical oncologist, incorporate research into my daily practice uh, dealing with the cancer care continuum. And I suppose there's one very obvious way that we incorporate research into our practice, and that's always, hopefully, practicing evidence-based medicine. So uh, any a recommendation I make to a patient is based on, as Frank was talking about, uh, high quality evidence. So I'm using the research of others and the uh, benefit that we have from the hundreds of thousands of patients who participated in cancer clinical trials over the years to guide my advice. But, but what I want to talk to you today about is incorporating research uh, that we conduct within the hospital into how we care for our patients. And hopefully you'll agree with me at the end that it's a good idea. So uh, this is another representation of the cancer care continuum that Brian spoke about, all the way from etiology and prevention to the detection, diagnosis and treatment of cancer, and then on to survivorship, whether that be people who are cured of their disease and are going on to lead the rest of their lives, or people who unfortunately are not cured and who are ultimately going on to end-of-life care. And the question is, uh, where does research fit into this cancer care continuum? So the traditional approach was to consider research uh, as being appropriate at this phase, the treatment phase. Uh, and when we conduct research in the treatment phase of the cancer care continuum, uh, we're, we're asking a couple of questions. And these questions have been, what treatments can we give to increase the likelihood of cure or increase the length of survival. And you'll notice that traditionally their quality of life, which we know is important to patients, particularly from that amazing video earlier on, is uh, of great importance. But traditionally, that wasn't what we looked at with research. Uh, and uh, that is changing, thankfully. So the real answer is that research in, in oncology should focus on all of these areas. If we want to improve the outcomes for all of our patients and prevent the development of cancer and prevent patients from people from turning into patients, we need to focus research in all of these areas. Uh, so we, we need to look for novel treatments, of course we do. We also want to prevent cancer in high-risk people. We want new tools to detect cancer at an early stage. We want tools to identify patients at high risk of side effects monitoring the efficacy of treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could go on and on all evening. I'm going to focus on cancer research at the Bond Scores Cork, and really I'm going to talk about those four latter phases, detection, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. So firstly, I'll talk about the treatment, the traditional area of research. And we conduct research through um, national and international clinical trials. So to this year, we're celebrating our 20th year of clinical trials at the Bond Scores in Cork. And really, we've had phenomenal expansion, particularly in the last decade. Uh, and we now have nearly 600 patients who have been enrolled in clinical trials over the, over the years. Uh, over that time, we've had clinical trials in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, ovarian, upper GI, lymphoma, and pancreatic cancer. And since I came in the last seven years, uh, uh, it's been amazing to see the expansion from a half-time nurse specialist to now having two full-time nurse specialists, a data manager, and a dedicated research pharmacist, along with all the other people who work with us to help us make trials work. And what I want to do is I want to take an example of one clinical trial that we have open at the moment and talk you through a little bit about what's involved in that clinical trial and why perhaps we picked it. So this is the forward one study in ovarian cancer. And this slide here illustrates what the, some of the problems with ovarian cancer. Uh, Matt spoke about this earlier on. Uh, this is the typical journey for a patient with ovarian cancer. And you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, they're diagnosed, they have a high treatment burden represented at the, by the curve there, uh, but they undergo their chemotherapy and surgery, as we spoke about, and their, their disease improves. And then they have a relapse-free interval of perhaps 12 months on average. Symptoms recur. They are treated again with treatment, shorter relapse-free interval, and then it becomes shorter. Uh, and over on the right-hand side, you can see platinum-resistant disease, where patients have 
very little benefit from treatment, they still have a high burden of symptoms, and their time is short, and ultimately they may develop occlusive abdominal disease and pass away. So this is a point of time in the ovarian cancer journey where we urgently need better treatments. The treatments that we have for platinum-resistant disease just are not good enough. So as part of my remit as a, an oncologist treating ovarian cancer, I was actively searching for trials that would be relevant for patients with platinum resistance disease. And we came across this drug here, which is Mervatoximab sorofatancine. Uh, say that when, you're, uh, when you've had a few drinks, okay? This is a, a drug that, um, excuse me, uh, it, oh, there you go. It's an antibody drug conjugate. It is a very small chemotherapy uh, molecule which is connected to an antibody directed against a marker on the surface of the ovarian cancer cell. And this delivers the chemotherapy to the ovarian cancer cell. This marker is expressed in around 60% of patients with platinum resistant cancer. And there is some preliminary data to suggest that this uh, drug may be particularly uh, effective in the platinum resistant setting. So we have opened uh, the forward one study for our patients. It's nearly completed accrual actually. Uh, and right now, uh, there, Ireland is the highest accruing country in the world for this study. Uh, per capita, I should add, the US is obviously ahead, uh, but there are nine patients accrued in Ireland and seven of those patients are in the Bon Secours in Cork. So we're really proud of, of being able to offer that to our patients. Uh, the slide that I, we skipped over there was just to the number of other people who are involved. You know, we have an amazing clinical trials team, but we have a huge network of people within the hospital who are involved from surgeons, uh, uh, pathologists, the lab, pharmacy, phlebotomy, all of the other nursing staff, palliative care, all of these are involved with these patients. Uh, so it wouldn't work without them. So then looking at the other areas of research, apart from clinical trials, I wanted to talk briefly about a, a translational study we have open looking at detection. And this is a collaborative effort with UCC. So we're looking at patients with DCIS. Now this is ductal carcinoma in situ. It's a precancerous uh, breast lesion can lead to invasive breast cancer. It is presents with either a symptomatic mass or on a mammogram. And currently, a biopsy is needed to confirm the diagnosis, and this is obviously an, an invasive procedure. If DCIS is not detected, it may progress to invasive cancer with all of the associated problems. So there's a, a potential biomarker in long non-coding RNA, which could be potentially detected in a serum sample from patients, uh, potentially avoiding the need for biopsy. So uh, we have initiated, an investigator initiated collaborative translational study. So I am the, on the clinical side, along with all of the rest of the research team. So we're responsible for, for identifying patients at our breast cancer MDT, consenting them, collecting their blood and tissue samples, and recording the clinical pathologic features of their DCIS. So we identify patients with DCIS who are undergoing surgery. We send their samples to a researcher called Kelly Dean in the School of Biochemistry and Cell Biology in UCC, who performs RNA isolation and sequencing from the serum and tissue samples. And then she collaborates with a guy called Sudipto Das, who is in the Royal College of Sur Surgeons of Ireland Molecular and Cellular Therapeutics Department, who maps and quantifies the RNA reads. And it is hoped that this is going to uh, lead potentially to a test which can be used to identify patients with DCIS in the future. And this study was granted a Translational Research Access Program funding award from UCC in September 2016, which has allowed us to complete it. Similarly, Brian, who was just speaking, uh, has recently received very significant funding from Science Foundation Ireland for a project in collaboration with the School of Engineering in UCC and the Cork Cancer Research Centre, uh, which is uh, looking at something that Dwight was talking about earlier on, which is the abscopal effect with immunotherapy. Uh, but instead of using radiotherapy to lesions to create the absco abscopal effect, he's looking at using electrochemotherapy which is a form of electroporation, 
which has been used for a long time in Cork as well as several other uh, centres around the world to treat skin lesions and, and can be very useful for melanomas, for example, and for ulcerating breast lesions. Uh, but in this case, it's looking at using it internally, so using virtual reality to guide electrochemotherapy to liver metastatic deposits from melanoma. So that's going to be a really interesting project. So both of these projects, what they represent is the concept of bench to bedside and then back again. So traditionally, we've thought of research as representing the right-hand side of this picture here, where the basic scientists do their work, they develop, they identify targets, they develop the treatments, and then they're finished they pass on that, uh, those treatments to us and we use them in the clinical setting or test them in the clinical setting. But we have to look at the left-hand side of the loop as well, as, which is where we feed back to the basic scientists from the clinical setting and we continue to research and to try and improve things. So um, uh, the next study I'm going to talk about briefly is it kind of straddles the areas of diagnosis and treatment. And this is uh, a study that we initiated here as well, uh, looking at DPYD mutation testing. Now briefly, DPYD is a gene which codes for a protein called DPD, which is involved in the metabolism and excretion of certain chemotherapy drugs called fluoropyrimidines. And we were interested in DPYD mutations because patients about three to five percent of patients carry a mutation in the gene and they are much more prone to toxicity with this chemotherapy. And I had a woman, that's a cartoon of this woman basically, uh, who was treated in 2012, adjuvant treatment for colon cancer. We had no definite proof that she had colon cancer in her body, but we were treating the risk with adjuvant chemotherapy. And she spent 11 days intubated and ventilated, having experienced severe toxicity. Now, we knew, we, the tradition was we would identify patients who had really severe toxicity and then we test them for mutations and we'd say, aha, we know why you got the toxicity uh, because we did a test and we found out why. And they said, great, and you didn't think of doing this before I had the chemotherapy. So we said, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. So we looked to see what would be the implication of doing prospective DPYD testing on our patients before they got toxicity. So we looked at patients from 2010 to 2012. Uh, actually, Dr. Gull, one of our registrars did this. He's, he's at the back of the room there, so he did all the hard work. Uh, so these were patients who had grade three and four toxicity. And as was standard of care at the time, we did reactive testing in that cohort of patients. And then we said, for those patients who develop very severe toxicity, what was the cost of the admission for just that one admission when they presented with the really bad toxicity? And we added that up. And then we looked at and said, what would be the cost to do testing on all patients commencing fluoropyrimidine chemotherapy? So it was quite a simple question. So just as we expected, we found about 4% of our population had DPYD mutations, and they represented about 20% of the people who developed severe toxicity. And we found that the total cost of admissions for those patients with the DPYD mutations vastly uh, dwarfed the cost of prospectively testing all patients, uh, representing a potential cost saving of 130,000 euro for our hospital alone. Now, this was for our poster. We've subsequently gone on to do more complex economic modeling, uh, you know, looking at the public health care system, looking at the potential cost implications for Ireland. But we changed our practice, and all patients in the bonds now starting fluoropyrimidine chemotherapy are prospectively tested. So this is an example of research that can be done in-house that can radically change treatment outcomes for our patients. And it doesn't always have to be complex. So I can think of at least five, just I've listed off here, recent studies that we've conducted, often with um, final year medical students from UCC that have directly impacted on my practice. So we looked at the scheduling of paclitaxel, whether we give it weekly or biweekly, on the likelihood of completing therapy as planned. We recently at ASCO GU, just a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, we presented a poster on the prevalence of overweight and diabetes in men with metastatic prostate cancer. We've looked at adherence to cardiac monitoring in patients receiving Herceptin and the need for prolonged monitoring in patients receiving subcutaneous Herceptin. And we've recently looked also at the long-term status of VRE colonized patients, this is a resistant organism in an, in an Irish oncology ward, so that we can devise guidelines for how these patients should be monitored and isolated. F 
finally, in terms of in terms of research survivorship, this is an underexplored area. It has to be said, but Brian, uh, in in combination with one of the final year students, uh, has looked uh, at a number of survivorship projects uh, recently, and this is one of his projects, looking at quality of life in breast and colorectal cancer survivors. So using a validated questionnaire and patients five years post-diagnosis. Uh, happily, we're, saving, we're seeing quite a good global quality of life in our patients, but some intriguing differences between the breast cancer survivors and the colorectal cancer survivors. In general, the breast cancer survivors do worse on some of the independent components of quality of life, including insomnia, fatigue, and constipation. And this kind of information is very important so that we can tailor our survivorship plans for these patients um, and, and plan how best to enable our patients to get on with their lives post-cancer. So to conclude, I would say that research is an integral component of every step of the cancer continuum and that if we are to be doing our jobs correctly and aiming to treat our patients correctly, we should be incorporating research on an everyday basis. So high quality research is feasible in a setting like ours. So firstly, clinical trials can access new and promising treatments for our patients. Secondly, investigator initiated research can directly improve our patient care. And thirdly, translational research is feasible in collaboration with basic science. So thank you very much. Thank you, Connellet. So if we have a question for either Connellet or Brian. I mean, I suppose uh, in terms of private hospitals in the country, you know, you're contributing far more to research than others, I think. But um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, you have quite a big team involved in it. Is it sort of cost neutral that it pays for itself? Uh, it, that's a really good question. I think we have been really, really fortunate, and I, I forgot to thank Harry uh, when I stood up here. Um, we have had such huge support from, from the hospital. Um, uh, we um, aim to be as cost neutral as possible. Uh, I think Harry has had a great vision in terms of cancer care. He has recognised that you know, I've, it's a marker of quality for an oncology team that we do offer research to our patients. So there is a certain halo effect that, you know, uh, we can, we can uh, continue to give high quality care if we include research. But we've also got better, uh, we run a combination of research in combination with Cancer Trials Ireland, as well as pharma research, and we try to make sure that we are covering as much of the costs as possible in order to keep it cost neutral for the hospital. I mean, I think that we're incredibly fortunate with the management support and the finance department support. In the public sector, there are data that show that clinical trials save the taxpayer money when expensive drugs that are standard of care are provided as part of these cancer trials by pharma. Um, in the private sector, similarly, when expensive drugs like bevacizumab are supplied um, we're not billing the insurer for the bevacizumab. So um, it's not so much that the hospital makes money and we try and make it cost neutral, but that we're helping our patients get a gold standard of care and it m keeps us on our toes and keeps us current by doing research. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Um, for the hospital, I suppose it's worth, um, um, it, it, it probably, there probably is a net cost. Um, we would assess that it's worth it, and I suppose it's worth saying in, for Bon Secours Health System, we're a not-for-profit organization. That's just as well, um, <laughs> with the two lads around. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, I think for us, uh, really for us as well, it, strategically where we operate in this part of the country, uh, we, we, most of our doctors, and you would have rem might remember it from the slide earlier, are working in full-time private practice. Um, so we, we need to provide supports, not just in medical oncology, but across the, uh, across the whole hospital and across all the specialties, we try and provide supports for people who are working in full-time private practice. So in another hospital in Dublin, some of the other private hospitals, a lot of the consultants, the medical oncologists um, working there will have a post in 
Beaumont or James's or one of the other bigger hospitals where they can have access to um, you know, trials and um, re resources that we have in place um, in Cork. So that's part of the reason if we want to attract the best people in terms of uh, our nursing staff, our pharmacy staff, paramedicals and oncologists, we have to be able to put in place um, you know, th th this type of, these type of resources. So that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.